Hi, everyone. I want to thank you all so much for joining us on today's webinar on the topic of advantages of the bipolar spectrum, the link to creativity explain. And we are so honored to have Dr. Tiffany Greenwood join us today to present on this. Dr. Greenwood is an associate professor in the Department of Psychiatry at UC San Diego, and her research focuses on defining the genetic architecture of bipolar disorder and schizophrenia using dimensional phenotypes to provide a better reflection of the underlying biological process. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Greenwood. Hey, thank you, Jake. Um, it's really a pleasure to um, be with you today. Um, and this is a topic that is um, of great interest to me and one I really enjoy speaking about. Um, and so, as you mentioned, I am a geneticist by training, but most of my work has focused on looking at alternative definitions of um, both bipolar disorder and schizophrenia. And a lot of this work has centered on looking at aspects of temperament, personality, and cognition. Um, and I've become increasingly interested in this connection between creativity and bipolar disorder because temperament, personality, and cognition contribute to creativity as well. And so I think if we understand um, this aspect of the shared vulnerability between creativity and bipolar disorder, it'll help us to understand um, the biological causes of bipolar disorder and that should facilitate treatment. And so we'll, we'll talk um, about how that might be able to be very helpful um, here today. Oops, uh-oh, my slide advancer's not working. Oh, that's fine. Um, if you could just all bear with us for one second while Dr. Greenwood gets that figured out, that'd be great. And I also would like to say that there will be a 15 minute question and answer session at the end of this presentation. So you can drop your questions throughout and we'll take time to get to as many as we can after. It's not working. Oh, that's fine. Maybe you could just try to unshare and then start okay. the sharing one more time. Okay. Actually, um, you know what, let me... Can you see my screen? I can see it, yeah. There we go. Okay. Awesome. All right, here we go. Here we go. <laughs> Tried to work out those technical issues, but it didn't right, quite. Without, without further ado, here's the presentation. Here we go. Okay, so I just wanted to um, very quickly acknowledge my collaborators and the sources of funding that made this work possible. Um, and so I feel like, um, that. Um, you know, bipolar disorder is really um, different than most common medical illnesses. Um, and in that it's often perceived to be associated with these positive aspects. And I think the magic button question um, really highlights this fact. And this question has been posed in a few different settings and basically asked if there were a button that you could press that would take away your bipolar disorder, would you press it? Um, and in one study um, conducted online of, it's not working again. Oh my gosh. Uh, I don't know what to do. <laughs> I don't know what to do. I can't go through my slides. Don't worry about it. Let's see. There we go. Okay. I just have to press it physically on the slide, I guess. Sounds okay. Good. <laughs> of um, an online study of more than 3,300 3, people only 54% actually said yes, that they would push that button to take away their bipolar disorder completely. And that's quite astounding when you think about that, because what other medical illness would you ever feel would have that um, kind of a, an effect? I mean, most people would just push that button and get rid of their um, pain and suffering. But bipolar disorder is different. And while it's um, clearly associated with a lot of negative aspects that um, cause uh, a lot of disruption in one's life and are associated with um, disability. It also, for many, um, many feel that being bipolar is an inherent part of their identity and that it imbues them with certain positive um, characteristics, creativity being one, but there are several that people feel are associated with bipolar disorder. Um, and for these individuals, the positives actually outweigh some of the negatives. And that's the reason they would not choose to push that button and completely eliminate the, the disorder. Of course, they might be very willing to release some of the negative aspects and simply have the positives. And um, hopefully that can be a future point of research so that we can allow that to happen um, and not take away all of it at once. 
Um, but I think that um, this is really an interesting topic. And if we're going to treat um, bipolar disorder better and more effectively and in a personalized treatment manner, um, I think we really need to consider both the negatives and the positives because they, they both contribute to someone's um, willingness to seek treatment um, and to comply with the treatment. And that's, that's one disadvantage of some of these positives. Um, they come at that cost where people delay tre seeking treatment and may not want to comply because they don't want to lose those positive aspects. So, um, so this, this connection between creativity and bipolar disorder dates back to the time of Aristotle's observation that no great genius has ever existed without a stream of madness. And there have been a wealth of investigations in this area that have supported this notion. Studies of eminently creative individuals report an overrepresentation of mood disorder and psychosis. Um, large population-based studies um, that look more at everyday creativity, so not the eminently creative Van Goghs of the world, but just everyday creativity, they also report a significant overrepresentation of bipolar patients and their unaffected first degree relatives in these creative occupations. Some studies have looked at creative performance um, in bipolar patients and their unaffected um, offspring and found that their performance is actually comparable to that of creative individuals. So together, this suggests that there is a strong familial um, connection between creativity and bipolar disorder. However, um, it is the, the creativity and professional success are actually more prominent in the unaffected first degree relatives rather than the people who have bipolar disorder themselves. And creativity and eminence are also more often associated with bipolar spectrum traits rather than the full blown illness. So this is suggesting that there are aspects of the bipolar spectrum that contribute to higher creativity but that the increasing symptom pathology actually can be a detriment to creative achievement. Okay, so um, many have suggested this kind of model of a shared vulnerability between creativity and bipolar disorder. And this is the classic inverted U representation of that model. And so basically it suggests that creativity would increase um, along with genetic risk for bipolar disorder up into a threshold. And at that point, it would begin to diminish um, with the increasing impairment associated with the symptoms of bipolar disorder. Um, and there, um, there are several traits that likely mediate this shared vulnerability and contribute to the creativity. Um, these are bipolar spectrum traits, and they represent the soft expression of the bipolar phenotype. And there are several temperament and personality traits that have been shown to be related to bipolar disorder, to creativity and bipolar disorder, and creativity in unaffected individuals. And these represent candidates for that shared vulnerability. And some have even suggested that these traits are actually evolutionarily adaptive. So in this next figure, just like the previous, they're, they both are saying the same thing. And it's, they're both saying that these bipolar spectrum traits are associated with the underlying um, condition of bipolar disorder, and they're contributed through um, genetic risk for the illness. And they, they tend to increase. And at the, the high end on the extreme is bipolar disorder. But there's a threshold at which um, the genetic risk is more moderate. And we have this increase in the expression of these phenotypes in unaffected individuals. And at that point is where you would find um, the genes for creativity. And so it's really this mild to moderate expression of, bi of bipolar phenotypes that provides an advantage for creativity. And the genes for bipolar disorder would then be expected to be maintained in the population by unaffected individuals, a portion of whom are actually benefiting from an increased fitness that's um, being conferred by these positive bipolar spectrum traits. And there have been a few genetic studies that have um, supported this um, idea of this shared genetic vulnerability. So these bipolar spectrum traits or shared vulnerability traits would lie in the space between bipolar disorder and creativity and be shared between the two. Um, and they would be exhibited by those who are creative and also those who are at a higher genetic risk for bipolar disorder. So some of these traits refer to um, the mood instability that's associated with bipolar disorder, like the psychothymic temperament. And so psychothymic temperament Temperament refers to that changeable mood, a wide range of emotion and emotional intensity. 
And of course, at the extreme, in bipolar disorder, we would find mood cycling. But this is a, a softer expression of that phenotype. Um, hypomanic personality is a softer expression, of course, of hypomania and um, mania. And it's associated with high mood and energy, enhanced flow of ideas, self-confidence, social ease, and risk-taking. Um, and it's thought to provide an advantage for success, which has often been referred to as the hypomanic edge. Okay. Um, other traits refer to kind of an experiencing type of a personality. Um, so impulsivity is one of these. And this is characterized by racing thoughts, which again, are not the racing thoughts we associate with bipolar disorder and mania, but kind of a, a subclinical expression of racing thoughts. So someone who just has a lot of ideas. Um, people with impulsivity tend to be um, more easily distracted. They have changing interests, restless and spontaneous behavior. Positive schizotypy um, refers to cognitive disorganization and unusual perceptual experiences. And it's been um, repeatedly observed to be enhanced in individuals who are active in the creative arts. And it's thought to represent that subclinical expression of the genes underlying psychosis. And finally, openness to experience. Um, now this personality trait is a little bit different. All the others can be pushed to the extreme in the context of the illness, whereas openness is just truly a positive trait. It can't be extreme. I mean, even if you are very high on openness, it's still a positive thing. Um, so this characterizes people who are imaginative, curious, open-minded, and empathetic. Um, it's, it's a central feature of creativity and has been repeatedly been associated with those who are creative. Um, Over-inclusive thinking is a cognitive style that's also been associated with creativity. It involves novel associations um, among remotely connected ideas. And so this facilitates originality. So this is that creative thinking, um, the novel thinking, the originality that we see um, in creativity. Um, and interestingly, increased word production and um, outside of this kind of over-inclusive thinking um, making loose associations is seen in mania. And it's actually been shown to be comparable to what is seen in creative writers. So there's that connection there to bipolar disorder. Creative individuals are also thought to have a cognitive advantage, perhaps in terms of high IQ and cognitive flexibility. IQ has actually been associated with creativity, but it's necessary but not sufficient for high creativity. So once an IQ level of about 120 has been reached, it actually becomes personality factors that become more predictive of creative success. And one of those factors is openness. Um, creative individuals also tend to have a more positive mood and that has been shown to provide a significant advantage um, for creative thinking. So um, there have been several studies that have attempted to um, identify and validate these shared vulnerability traits. Um, the problem is that most have either used very small samples or a very limited number of phenotypes. Um, so they're not, it's difficult to compare results across these studies. Some, some studies have not even used bipolar individuals. They've only relied on um, aspects of creativity in unaffected individuals. And none has really looked at all of them in the same sample in all three groups, the non-creative, creative, and bipolar. And that's really what needs to be done. So while this, there's a huge set of data that supports these notions and provides support for specific um, aspects of the shared vulnerability, um, what we really want to do is provide one definitive study that included everything. And so that's what I'm gonna describe here. Um, so for this um, study, we wanted to include all three groups that defined um, that shared vulnerability. So we're really modeling the study after that inverted U relationship. We want people who are not creative, we want people who are creative, and those who have bipolar disorder, whether they're creative or not, just have the illness. And so um, we conducted uh, structural, structured clinical interviews on all participants of the study, um, and this was to not only confirm diagnoses of bipolar disorder, but also to make sure that the unaffected individuals in the study had no personal or family history of mood disorder or psychosis. So anyone 
um, who was an, supposed to be an uninfected participant um, was ruled out if they had a history of obviously a bipolar disorder, um, then they'd be in the other category. Um, his history of psychosis or um, major recurrent depression, which is genetically related to bipolar disorder. So we wanted to make sure that we weren't picking up some um, noise in the data by including in, anyone there. Also family history as well. So they would be at genetic liability for these disorders. So we wanted to make sure that we weren't um, ad introducing additional noise. So we ran a, actually a quite extensive temperament and personality battery um, on, the, on our sample. Um, I'm only gonna talk about um, a subset of the traits today because these were the primary hypotheses. This was what we were really trying to study and these are the shared vulnerability traits. Of course, many of these traits come as part of a larger battery. And so we just administered the entire battery because we wanted to provide um, some contrast between traits that are not associated with creativity and are only associated with bipolar disorder and those that are shared between them. So I'm only gonna focus on the shared vulnerability traits today or those that we propose to be shared vulnerability traits. Um, if you're interested in seeing the full study, the results were recently published last year. And I don't know that they're publicly available yet, but I would be happy to um, provide a copy to anyone who's interested. So the traits that we looked at are the ones that I mentioned in terms of that shared vulnerability space in the previous slide. These are the hypomanic personality, the psychothymic temperament. Um, hyperthymic temperament is part of the battery that is associated, uh, that is used to test psychothymic temperament. So we evaluated that too. And it provides a nice representation of the positive mood that is predicted to be enhanced in the creative individuals. We looked at schizotypy, which is that um, subclinical expression of psychosis, impulsivity, and of course, openness, which is that central feature of creativity. In terms of creativity itself, um, we evaluated um, creative performance using a divergent thinking task, which is outside the box thinking. And we also looked at aspects of achievement. So I will say that our initial studies that I will show you did consider creativity defined by occupation because this is what all the other studies have done. So we wanted to provide a common platform to be able to um, compare our results to other studies. However, um, in later parts of the study, which I'll show you, we actually went back to the achievement um, because that's really a better way to identify creativity. Um, just being involved in a creative profession doesn't really tell you much, and I'll show you why. Oops. Here we go. Um, so we also looked at aspects of cognition. We looked at verbal and nonverbal reasoning, which measure fluid intelligence and um, provide a measure of problem solving ability and creative problem solving. These also are a reflection of IQ, which was predicted to be a little bit higher in the creative individuals. Um, we looked at humor appreciation, which has been um, previously suggested to be part of the, um, the creative profile, um, but hasn't really been tested in this way. We also looked at spatial processing, which is an interesting phenotype that might be advantageous for those who are particularly involved in a visual art. And we looked at memory as kind of a baseline cognitive function. So the final groups included 111 individuals with bipolar disorder and 205 individuals who um, were unaffected. 102 of those reported being involved in a creative profession or having significant creative activities. So we considered those to be our creative controls and the remaining individuals did not report any involvement in um, creative activities. Um, and they formed our non-creative control group. The um, distribution of gender, age, and education was similar and not significantly different between these three groups. Overall, we had about 63% female participants. Um, the average age of the participant was 40. It ranged um, quite a bit, but that was our average age. And um, our participants had on average 15 years of education. So this is at least some college. Um, most had completed at least high school and many had gone on to receive professional degrees, but on average, um, 15 years of education was standard across the sample. Um, in the bipolar group, we had 
a roughly equal distribution of bipolar one versus bipolar two disorder, a little bit more um, of individuals with bipolar one. And across the entire group of bipolar participants, we had about 38% who reported being involved in a creative profession. We didn't actually recruit people who were creative and bipolar, they just came. <laughs> so um, more than a third of the bipolar sample reported being creative. So we analyzed these shared vulnerability traits. And what we were looking for were certain patterns of expression. Um, the primary pattern we were looking for in terms of temperament and personality is this one that rep represents that kind of um, intermediate phenotype uh, pattern where bipolar disorder exists at the extreme because these are traits that presumably underlie the illness and the creative controls um, express them, but in a more moderate or mild fashion and would be significantly higher than the non-creative controls. We also were expecting a pattern where the creative controls had an advantage and we didn't really find a difference between the non-creative and bipolar groups. Um, for these traits, we would expect to see this for hyperthymic temperament, which is that positive mood that was predicted to be um, unique to the creative group and provide an advantage in terms of um, creative thinking. Um, we also predicted that they would have that cognitive advantage um, in terms of IQ and other aspects of cognition. And then finally, um, there were some, some test hypotheses. Um, so the literature does suggest that openness is um, enhanced in bipolar disorder, but it's so strongly correlated with creativity. And so the actual um, relationship of the phenotype in bipolar disorder to those who are creative is somewhat of an unknown, so we want to explore that a little bit further. We also um, presumed that creative performance um, and achievement would be higher in the bipolar group, but possibly not quite as high as in the creative control group. So the literature on these particular um, items is a little bit less consistent. Um, there just aren't a lot of studies looking at creative performance in bipolar individuals. There are a few. Um, so these were kind of our test variables. Okay, so this is a, an initial graph of the results. And so I'm just going to kind of orient you because this will be how I will present all of the results for the study. So what you see here is kind of a clustering of the phenotypes in the non-creative group at zero. And that's by design because the scales for each of these phenotypes um, differ quite dramatically. And so if we just presented the raw scores, um, it'd be very difficult to compare um, the results between the groups. And we certainly couldn't look at them all on the same graph. So in, in converting these scores to standard scores where the mean of the non-creative control group is zero, and we have a standard deviation of one, and then applying that metric to the entire uh, sample, we were able to not only visualize all of the traits on a single graph, but we also are able to, um, to visualize them as effect scores. So effect sizes are um, the, what they sound like, the effects of the trait in one group compared to the other. So all of these results are compared to the non-creative group. Um, an effect size of about 0.2 is considered small. So it would be a small effect. It can be significant if the sample size is large enough, but it's, it's kind of a smaller effect. Anything less than 0.2 is not significantly um, having an effect. Um, an effect size of 0.5 would be a medium effect size or moderate effect size. Um, and anything of 0.8 or larger um, is a large effect size. And so when we look at the creative group, we can see that all of the proposed shared vulnerability traits are significantly elevated in the creative group compared to the non-creative group. We also see an elevation in the hyperthymic temperament, which again is that positive mood that we predicted would be elevated in creativity. When we add the bipolar group, we <laughs> clearly have to change the scale quite a bit. And that's because as um, hypothesized, the bipolar spectrum traits, the psychothymic temperament, the hypomania and the, um, or hypomanic personality and the positive schizotypy, these are, expressions of the bipolar phenotype. And so the bipolar group exists at the extreme. And so that's, we did actually find that pattern that we were expecting. Um, impulsivity as well, because that's a reflection of um, the bipolar phenotype as well. So we did not find hyperthymic temperament to be elevated in bipolar group. So it does seem that that would be 
something that is specific and characteristic of the creative group alone. Openness was kind of interesting. So this, remember, was one of our test, um, test uh, hypotheses. Um, we expected it would be elevated in bipolar disorder, and it is. It's significantly different from the non-creative group with an effect size of about 0.6. Um, and the creative group still maintains the advantage. So the creative group is still significantly higher than the bipolar group, which is intermediate between um, creative and non-creative individuals. So I'd like to point out that all of these shared vulnerability traits, as well as the hyperthymic temperament, were actually associated with creative achievement among unaffected individuals. So all of these traits, whether they were part of the bipolar spectrum or something um, that truly is a positive trait, were predicted higher achievement when expressed in a higher form within moderation. In the bipolar group, however, only openness to experience was actually associated with creative achievement because as one would expect, those that underlie the bipolar spectrum are pushed so far to the extreme that they really can't provide an advantage for, um, for creative achievement. So to look at the cognitive traits, we used a customized neuropsychological battery. And as I mentioned, we looked at nonverbal reasoning, which used um, a matrix reasoning test that may be familiar to some of you. It um, is often used to look at giftedness in children and is often used as an IQ test for adults. And so in this test, they are presented with an array and asked to choose the appropriate response that would fit in that array. We also administered a verbal reasoning, which used um, word analogies and asked them to pick um, the word that best uh, fit the analogy. And each of these tasks um, were progressive, meaning that if they got the answer right, they would get progressively harder and harder until they um, started to miss questions and that would, the, um, the difficulty would decrease to really kind of pinpoint where their um, skills lie and their IQ is. And so these were combined into a single measure of reasoning ability for the analysis. We looked at spatial processing. Um, so this presents two lines at an angle to one another and asks the participants to rotate the blue line so that it becomes parallel to the red line and assesses how easily and efficiently and accurately they are able to do this. So how many button presses they need to actually get them to line up and be parallel. Um, and in terms of memory, we included three different tasks um, and provided 10 or sorry, 20 um, test subjects, test uh, prompts, <laughs> sorry. Um, we used words, um, images, uh, shapes in kind of a, a space, a three-dimensional space and faces. And they were presented with each of these items first and asked to memorize them and then presented again with these same items amongst 20 distractors um, and asked whether they thought they had seen this one before. And so these three um, memory tasks were combined for a single measurement of memory. So for humor appreciation, we use verbal and nonverbal methods to um, examine this. And the verbal presented headlines, one of which contained a joke, and the nonverbal presented cartoons, one of which contained a joke, and they were simply asked to, um, to select the one that they thought was more funny, or they could say that they were both equally funny. And these also were combined um, for a single measurement of humor appreciation. So to look at divergent thinking or that creative thinking, the outside of the box thinking, this is creative performance. Um, we use the Torrance test of creative thinking, which is a standardized um, measurement of this process. And we use three different tasks to look at divergent thinking ability, which also involves that um, element of over-inclusiveness that we've talked about being part of the shared vulnerability, because in order to think creatively, you have to make a lot of these associations that's gonna give you more novel responses. Um, so the first task involved product improvement. They were presented with a little stuffed elephant and asked um, if, to list how many different ways that they could um, think of to change this element, elephant and make it more fun for a kid to play with. And of course, think of the most interesting and unusual ways, not just you know anything that you can think of that'd be really different. Um, we also presented them with an unusual uses task, which asked them to 
lists as many unusual uses of the pamphlet common item. And in this case, we used a cardboard box. And finally, we have a just supposed task, which presented them with this image as a prompt and asked them to list as many consequences as they could think of, of clouds having strings that would hang down to earth. And each of these tasks was rated for fluency, which is the number of total ideas that they could come up with, flexibility, which is the categories of ideas, um, and this represents a shift in focus, um, and originality, which of course is how unique the ideas that they come up with are um, statistically. Um, and these three domains of the divergent thinking were analyzed separately. So we have fluency, flexibility, and originality. We also collapsed them into a overall um, divergent thinking score. So here again is a graph showing the results in the non-creative versus creative groups. And again, the non-creative group is um, centered at zero and the means in the creative group for these phenotypes um, represents an effect size. And so what we can see is that all of the traits, cognitive and creative, are significantly elevated in the creative control group. The, um, Creative performance, of course, is quite a bit higher than the cognitive traits, but these are all statistically significant differences. And when we add the bipolar group, what we see is that we really see that um, creative advantage in terms of cognition. Um, so that's what we we're expecting to see where the, where the bipolar and non-creative groups were about the same. And that you can see some variance here, but these are not statistically significant differences. Those two groups perform the same, and the creative control were the only group that had a little bit of an advantage here. I would also point out, though, that while the bipolar and um, control group or non creative control groups did not differ, the bipolar group also did not show deficits on these particular measures of cognition that we propose to be related to, to creativity. And that's not necessarily the case for other measures of cognition. There's um, quite a bit of literature looking at cognitive deficits in bipolar disorder. Um, and so there are deficits often observed for other cognitive functions, but not these that we thought would be related to creativity. So they aren't high, like the creative controls, but they also aren't deficient either. Um, when we look at the creative performance, what we see is that the bipolar and creative groups performed about the same. Um, so we, they, look, they look a little bit different. There um, is some variance there, but these are not statistically significant differences between the creative and bipolar groups. They both are quite a bit higher than the non-creative group, um, and that's a, a very strongly significant result. Um, you can see that there is the overall divergent thinking score, which is those three groups collapsed together. And then fluency and flexibility produce about the same results. Um, so I just collapse them into a single measure um, so that for ease of interpretation, otherwise the lines would be <laughs> really on top of each other. Um, and originality was really um, where both of these groups could shine. Um, they came up with quite novel ideas. So these studies really have confirmed um, these aspects of the shared vulnerability between creativity and bipolar disorder. Um, the temperament and personality traits that were postulated to underlie the, the clinical expression of bipolar disorder, where um, those with the disorder would lie at the extreme, but they would still be moderately elevated in the creative group um, that was found to be the case. We also found that um, the two groups shared openness and this over-inclusive thinking, which was measured through these creative performance tasks. Um, and we also found that the creative group did appear to have a cognitive advantage and also um, that positive mood, which was um, in theory providing an extra cognitive advantage um, in terms of creative thinking. So we're really excited about these results because it proved all the hypotheses we had. Um, the thing that gave me pause, however, was the fact that about 38% of our bipolar group reported being creative. And so while I believe that the um, results for the bipolar spectrum traits would not be affected by this and nor would the cognitive traits, I did worry that the results for openness and creative performance, which were quite high, were being affected by these individuals who were creative and bipolar. And so I wanted to delve into that a little bit more and tease that out. So for that, we used our creative achievement questionnaire 
And this is a standardized questionnaire that evaluates achievement across 10 domains of creativity. And so we administered this to everyone in the sample. And I'm just showing you the visual arts and the music because those were the more common um, areas of creativity in our study, although we did have individuals that had creativity across all of these um, um, domains. Um, so you can see when you look at the visual arts one, for example, we asked them to put an X next to any question that was true for them. And then if it had an asterisk to mark how many times it was true for them. So you can see that it can range from zero when someone has no training or any kind of talent in that area, way up to possibly several hundred um, if they have had their work critiqued in a national publication multiple times. And so there's really this broad range for any single domain. And oftentimes people who are creative have some achievement across multiple domains. Um, so we looked at these various um, domains of creativity, came up with an overall achievement score, and then standardized um, those achievement scores. And so that's what you can see here. So just like with the other traits, we um, set the control mean, the non-creative control mean to zero with a standard deviation of one. And so now you can see what kind of that would look like. So there's still a lot of variation in the normal control group, um, but the mean is set to zero. Um, when you look at the creative control group, you can see that the scores are quite a bit shifted compared to the non-creatives and the bipolar has kind of a range that overlaps both groups. So what we wanted to do here was really define what high creativity looked like using um, our achievement scores. Um, so normally when I would do a study of quantitative traits like just temperament or personality or cognition in another um, context, the line that I would draw, the threshold I would use would be three standard deviations from the mean. Because this line represents the 99.7 percentile. And if someone is crossing that threshold and they're the only ones over there, they're outliers. And so they should be removed from the study. However, this is a study of outliers. <laughs> we want people to be across that threshold. So the threshold provided a nice um, cutting point because none of the non-creative controls crossed it. So we didn't have anyone that was an outlier um, in terms of the non-creative control group. In the creative control group, it actually turned out quite nicely. So when we looked at the CAC, those people who had passed that threshold really were hitting these higher levels of creativity. Their work was being recognized objectively as being creative in a public way. So these aren't just people who are selling their work, which they are, but they are actually being publicly recognized as having talent. So they're crossing this kind of threshold of achievement. Whereas those, um, who fall to the other side, they are involved in creative professions, but they just aren't, um, it's more everyday creativity. They just aren't having that same high level of achievement. And so that provided a really nice cut point. Um, and moving forward, we eliminated those who did not meet this kind of high creativity threshold. And we also applied it to the bipolar group. And it kind of worked out nicely there too. It actually identified all of the people on the sample who came in saying they were involved in the creative profession and none of the people who did not say that. So it provided this nice um, means of separating out people who had more everyday creativity who, um, in the bipolar group and those who were working professionals as creatives. So when we looked at these data, we looked at all of the uh, shared vulnerability traits again. Um, and none were really different. So the bipolar group, whether they were creative or not creative, they were still very high on those shared vulnerability traits um, because they do represent the illness itself. So they were still at the extreme no matter what. They also didn't perform any differently on the, the cognitive tests. Where they did perform differently are on those measures that I was a little bit worried about, um, the creative performance and the openness. So this is what the data look like. So you can see um, a couple of things that are um, worth mentioning. One, the creative bipolar group looks a whole lot like the creative control group. They are very high on their creative performance. Their scores for openness are identical and they both are highly original. We also interestingly now see a hint of that hyperthymic temperament that originally was particular to the creative control group. Now we're starting to see that in the creative bipolar group. So that's suggesting that that trait, that positive mood is really um, associated with creativity. Um, however, in the non-creative bipolar group, 
we still see aspects of openness and creative performance and originality in particular that are significantly elevated in this group compared to the non-creative controls. So this really does suggest that creativity and openness are part of the bipolar um, expression. Um, they, they really are positive traits that are exhibited by many people who have bipolar disorder. And in fact, when you look at the standardized um, achievement score in even the non-creative individuals, it still has an effect size of 0.6. So that's significantly higher than the non-creative controls. So they do maintain some level of, um, of creativity and achievement, although not to the high level that the, um, the other group of highly creative bipolar um, individuals do. I mean, their achievement scores were <laughs> very, very high, around six, just like the creative controls. And so um, I think this, this satisfied my worry that we really were only seeing these results for creative performance and openness in the bipolar group because of these highly creative bipolar individuals. They are not being driven by that subset of the group. They're actually um, present in bipolar disorder as well. So um, kind of to end, I wanted to talk about treatment because <clears throat> thinking about the positive aspects of bipolar disorder is kind of fun, but this is a serious disorder. And so we don't want to lose sight of the fact that, um, you know, we are talking about an illness that requires treatment and that being creative might provide some um, obstructions to seeking that treatment. So non-compliance um, with medications and treatment is just a general problem in bipolar disorder anyway, but it's particularly an issue for those who are creative because they associate those mood swings with their creative ability. And so they don't really want to limit the mood swings. And that makes a lot of sense. I mean, if you feel that you're creative because your mood is so variable and you have those highs or lows, why would you want to limit that? You want to be creative. Um, so many people will begin a treatment plan and discontinue their medications because they feel that it's diminishing their creativity. And this can absolutely happen at first. But typically, once someone finds the right medication for them and becomes stable, the creativity comes back and it's more productive now because it's not being limited by those really high extreme expressions of the bipolar phenotype. I mean, we could see that in the data that it wasn't really an advantage to have these really extreme um, expressions of bipolar disorder. So when we can limit that, the creativity can become more productive. And other individuals just find that the hypomania is enjoyable and they find that it's integral to their creative process. That's not really supported by the data, but that's the impression that, that they need that hypomania to be creative. And they just decide to not go, um, to be, to go untreated for that. Um, and this will also delay treatment seeking um, quite a bit for that reason. Um, however, the symptoms of bipolar disorder typically worsen over time. And when it's left untreated, the suicide rate is ninefold higher, and it's already fairly high with bipolar disorder anyway. And so a ninefold increase in um, risk for suicide is, is quite significant. And so we really wanna make sure that people um, with this illness are seeking appropriate treatment for them. And that can come in different forms, of course, um, but creativity should not be a hindrance to seeking treatment. Um, so the hope is that by studying this connection of bipolar disorder to creativity, we can make some strides towards facilitating personalized treatment. Um, so, so for those who do have these positive aspects and want to maintain them, the goal would be to limit the mood swings and not diminish that creativity. Um, as a geneticist, of course, my hope is that this studying this connection and the traits that lie between will shed light on the biological causes of bipolar disorder. And then that should provide us with new targets um, for medication that would be more specific um, to the mood swings um, without having an impact on the positive traits or other aspects. And um, there are a lot of unpleasant side effects in addition to loss of creativity that can be associated with bipolar medications. And so hopefully by targeting the biology a little bit more specifically, we can avoid those unpleasant side effects. Um, and finally, I believe that if we acknowledge um, that there are these positive aspects of bipolar disorder um, and that it, it, there is this relationship with creativity and that the genes that are causing illness are actually performing a positive function 
in society as a whole. They're facilitating creativity and invention. It's for moving um, human achievement forward. Um, <clears throat> you know, it, it will help us have more of an appreciation of neurodiversity. And I think it could go a long way to reducing the stigma. Um, and so I will just leave you with some comments of many people that I found, I mean, these are just a subset of people I found online that were talking about their, their illness and their struggles with medication um, and the positive aspects of bipolar disorder, because I think this is something that really resonates with a lot of people. And many um, want to be creative, but they also want to feel stable. And that's a, a struggle for them to find the right medication that helps them do both. I'll take any questions that anyone has. That was so amazing, Tiffany. I want to thank you so much for that presentation. If you have questions, please drop them in the chat and we will answer them. And one question that I have is between the creative bipolar disorder group and the creative control group, was there any differences in whether someone both participated in music and painting? For instance, was there more dual creative outlets in any one over the other? There, um, so there is a range. So what we would tend to see, as you can see, there were um, there's a range of creativity in the non-creative control group. Typically, what we would see there was um, people who wrote poetry, maybe won an award in high school, got it published in the lo local newspaper, but weren't poets. Um, people who played in the high school bands, um, maybe even the college band, maybe they play a few different instruments proficiently, but they don't play as part of a group. Um, so they endorse those kind of low, lower levels of creativity. And in some cases they did endorse um, creativity across a couple of different domains, but it was a much lower level. And the creative group is kind of split. There were some people who were extremely creative, like off the charts creative, their scores were extremely high in one domain. And then maybe just a smattering of other interests here and there. Um, others were um, very creative in more than one domain. And typically they were related to one another. We didn't necessarily see music and visual art both all the time. A lot of times we would see something like, for example, theater and film and creative writing, because those kind of go together often, right? Um, all right. So it, it, there was a mix. There, I, I can't really say that there was a lot more um, multiple domain endorsement of activity in the um, creative group. It's just the level was so much higher because this is what they do. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's great. That's super interesting. And our next question is, if you have ever done any studies on this with individuals that have both bipolar disorder and schizophrenia? Um, not yet, because yeah. so I actually, when I initially approached this project, what I wanted to look at was schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, and creativity. So I wanted to add a fourth group because there has been some suggestion of creativity and schizophrenia. However, there's many that believe that those, um, those uh, relationships of creativity with schizophrenia might actually be stemming from a misdiagnosis of bipolar disorder. And so there, there is a lot of misdiagnosis between bipolar disorder and schizophrenia. Um, you also have schizoaffective disorder, which has some of that you know, mood um, variance as well. It, it, that part didn't get funded, so we did what got funded. And honestly, the, the um, connection is so much stronger with bipolar disorder. Um, so, and I don't know that I really believe you can have both bipolar disorder and schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. um, if you have both symptoms, you would be schizoaffective. And that's really a different phenotype than bipolar disorder. Um, the psychosis is so prominent. And what I can tell you about schizophrenia, having worked on it for many, many years, cognitive deficits are very profound in schizophrenia. In fact, it's like one of the hallmark symptoms of the disorder. We could actually diagnose people with schizophrenia based on their cognitive profile. Um, and that's a lot of the treatments for schizophrenia involved, um, you know, improving cognitive function. That's not really the case with bipolar disorder. There is evidence for some cognitive deficits in some people. There's okay. also evidence for extreme IQ in some people. And then there's evidence for people being just the same as your, you know, your average unaffected individual. So there's really this range of um, cognitive ability and bipolar disorder that we don't see with schizophrenia. Um, they're, really, they're really quite different. And 
the types of creativity that are associated with schizophrenia tend to be math and science. In bipolar disorder, it tends to be writing and visual arts and music, more of these um, more really more creative expressions. So of course, someone can be creative and inventive in, in terms of math and science as well. And that's a, a, you know, a great characteristic to have, but what's really associated with bipolar disorder is more of this kind of what we think of as arts, you know, visual and performing arts. Oh, that's great. Thank you for clarifying that. And another question, is there any relationship between originality in relationship to when the individual's last episode was? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, I can't answer that one. <laughs> we didn't actually study that. So for the purpose of the study, we required that everyone be thymic um, or in kind of a, a baseline episode at their personal baseline because everyone's baseline is slightly different. Um, we wanted to make sure no one was actually in an episode. However, mm -hmm. we do have data on um, the most recent episode and the severity of that episode. But that's that's an interesting question. I might have to go back and investigate that. That's great. Well, if we have any more questions, please get them in. And one more we have is, how would one approach a conversation with their doctor about experiencing severe depressive bouts after their diagnosis and feeling that they're lacking creativity? Um, well, so would the creativity be due to medication that they're on or is it due to the depressive episode itself? Because um, creativity is sometimes thought to be a result of a depressive episode, like while someone is is down, they're, they're um, experiencing these deep, um, emotions and thoughts. And then when they come out um, and they are feeling productive, that's when the creative expression can happen. It's, most people aren't very creative when they're depressed. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm wondering, you know, if, if that lack of creativity is, is being perceived as part of the depression or is it being perceived um, based on the medications that are being used to treat the depression? And, you know, I think one thing about the current state of psychiatry is that these um, these positive traits aren't really well acknowledged or accepted. And that's part of the reason I wanted to do this work to, to really highlight the fact that many people feel them and okay. it's important to them. And they don't wanna take medication that's going to eliminate um, those positive aspects. And it's not just creativity. I mean, there's a lot of positive aspects that some people with bipolar disorder sort of feel are associated with their illness. Now, of course, there's people who don't, find any value in having the disorder and they were the ones that would push that button <laughs> very quickly. Um, and that's understandable as well. But for those that have these positive aspects, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a struggle. And I don't think um, all psychiatrists really um, acknowledge that and they should because it really um, impacts treatment and compliance, as I mentioned. Um, yeah, <laughs> I mean, when I was starting this study, I. I got a lot of kind of snarky comments from some of my colleagues about, well, well everyone with bipolar is deserves a creative. Uh -huh. And I said, well, yeah, we'll test that. Um, so it's not everyone, it's a lot of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's so, great. I think it's worth considering. So, our final question is, is Does the state of creativity happen more in hypomania than depression? So, I would definitely say that hypomania would be more associated with creativity. However, what the data really shows um, is that it's not the state of hypomania itself. I mean, of course, when someone's hypomanic, they feel um, more energized and they feel more productive and they might feel very creative, but the productivity level is a little bit fragmented. I mean, so they tend to start a lot of different things and maybe not follow through with all of them, but certainly they are, have that energy and they are you know, doing more things and thinking more things. Um, so it can feel very creative. However, I would suggest that the, the more mild version of hypomania, the hypomanic personality um, in, uh, in the absence of more you know, significant symptoms, that's really where the creativity um, can shine because the mood is stable. It's not gonna get too high. You're not gonna have that bout of depression that often will follow hypomania. Um, and you can have this kind of baseline level of creativity and productivity. 
So I think that's really kind of something key to highlight because a lot of people believe that that hypomania makes them creative. And there really isn't evidence to suggest that it's the actual hypomania. It's just things that come along with that that could still be present um, once the hypomania results. Well, good. I'm glad we got that clarified. And that about wraps up our webinar for today. I want to thank everyone so much for joining. And Dr. Greenwood, do you have any closing comments? Um, not really. Just that um, I, I do think this is a really important area of research. And I hope that um, by continuing to have this discussion about the positives and the negatives both, and consider both of them to be part of the bipolar experience, um, I hope that we really can provide better ways to treat people so that they get to maintain that creativity, um, but not have to deal with the negative aspects of the disorder. I agree. I agree completely. And goodbye, everyone. This webinar will be uploaded to ibpf.org. So please visit if you'd like to view the webinar or send it to any friends or loved ones. And have a great day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.